Welcome to this year's Wednesday Night Class with Robert Timmerman. The Book of Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. Join us each week as we examine these exciting Old Testament books. Well, good evening to our Zoom friends here. All three of you, glad to have you tonight. Maybe some, yeah, three. Well, maybe some folks will be joining us a little bit later, but thanks for coming on tonight. We are in Song of Solomon tonight, chapter three. We are going to do the entire chapter. It it sounds like a lot, but it's uh, 11 verses. So that's not so bad. If you have your outline, uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum's outline that we're using in his translation, we'll use that for our reading tonight. Uh, You're on page six and page seven of the outline. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter three, about in the middle of the page is where we're starting tonight. The fifth reflection, um, a dream of separation. So really quite a a special uh, text tonight. And uh, so we've got our um, our reader ready to go to read the entire chapter for us and lead us in prayer. And then we'll launch. Reflection, the dream of separation. Gentlemen. By my bed, day and night, I sought whom my love, my soul loved. I sought him, but he did not find him. I will rise up, and I will go around the city, in the markets, and in the streets. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen that go around the city found me. Did you see whom my soul loves? Scarce long that I passed from them, and I found him, my soul loves. I seized him. And did not let him go, till that I brought him into the house of my mother, and into the chambers of the one who gave him birth. I adjure you, the daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the hands of the field, that you do not allow them to stir up the earth, to make his place. Myrtle reunion reflections, the sixth reflection, the wedding procession, the daughters of Jerusalem. Who is this one coming up in the wilderness, like pillars of smoke, broom, by nerve, and frankincense, from all the center of the powers of the merchants? Behold the travel couch of Solomon. Sixty men, sixty mighty men are around it, from the mighty men of Israel. All of them are handlers of sword, expert in war. Each one has a sword on his thigh against the fear in the nights. A bed of state King Solomon made for himself from the trees of Lebanon. Its pillars are made of silver, its support of gold, its cushion of purple, its interior adorned from love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go ye forth and look ye, O daughters of Jerusalem, at King Solomon, with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding and on the day of the gladness of his heart. Praise you, Father God. God, we have to give thanks for for being a God that's made possible for us to talk directly to you, Father. We thank you for being present here by your Holy Spirit. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us and uh, our spirit that uh, would guide us in the truth of this word and how it applies to our lives. We pray for all the marriages here that that they're lifted up and they're built up because of what they're learning here at this uh, Song of Solomon. We also give you thanks again for blessing us with abundant, uh, abundant living Things you provide every day for us, our breath, our food, and housing. We thank you for this place of worship, Father, to come and gather and learn more about you. We thank you for Robert and his study and the way he prepares to bless us. We ask a blessing on him as he speaks tonight, Father. In his name I pray. Amen. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Chapter three uh, for tonight. So please find your way to the outline, uh, page six of uh, our comb books, Fruchtenbaum. If anybody needs uh, one tonight, there's still some extra copies um, over on the the uh, Welcome Center, if you care to get one of those. Uh, so, uh, yes, we're doing chapter three, verses one through 11 tonight. I just call it a ceremony of love. Uh, So we get a little glimpse of uh, courtship life in the Bible, courtship life prior to getting married. 
and what that's like. And then uh, a little bit about the uh, procession that leads to the wedding ceremony itself. Those are the two parts that we're looking at tonight uh, and to see what scripture says about that in its Old Testament setting. So last week, Solomon, just to review from last week, he's excited uh, before he got married here uh, to pay a visit to Shulamit at her home in Galilee during the springtime. And he is courting her and calls her to come out of her mother's house and to enjoy the blooming uh, flowers of creation with him. But she's not ready yet. (laughs) She's not ready. And she turns down his invitation and sends him back to work in the uh, fields and the pastures that uh, he owned in that northern part of Israel in Galilee. So that was a little summary to bring us up to speed from last week. Now, uh, in your Fruchtenbaum outline, page six, we're at number two, about in the middle of the page, the fifth reflection, a dream of separation. So we're, again, we're in the courtship phase. They're not married and uh, she she has this dream, which is really kind of interesting. So here's a little summary of, of verses one through uh, four. After Solomon leaves by her request from last week, after uh, two, verse 17, uh, she says, nope, not now, not now, maybe tomorrow morning, you know, when the uh, shadows flee away. Let's talk about it then. After he leaves by her request, she remembers a recurring dream that she had during the long winter months when she was apart from Solomon. Remember last week we looked at the fact that Israel really only has two seasons, you know, a summer and a winter. They have no transitional seasons uh, like we do fall and spring. So in her dream, she earnestly searches for him but she can't find him. This is like the hide and seek game almost, but he's not hiding, Uh, but she's seeking. And just when all hope was about to be lost, she found him and somewhat forcefully grabs hold of him whom she loves and brings him back to the safe confines of her mother's house. So, a round trip. Now, bear in mind, this is all a dream uh, in these verses, uh, one through, um, is it one through five? I guess, yeah, the fifth part of it is uh, the fifth verse is on page seven of the outline. But the dream is essentially verses one through four. She has this dream. And notice in verse one of the text, that's where we see that she's dreaming, right? Upon my bed, night after night. So she's dreaming. And uh, we know this is more than just uh, the single, you know, night where she sent him away and said, you know, go away. Let's talk about it in the morning uh, because of the expression night after night. In other words, she had this dream recurring over and over again. Have you ever had a dream recur over and over again? I, okay, I hear a lot of people saying that. D- d- did you ever understand the dream? I'm curious by chance. Anybody? Yeah. We, you can share some of that later if you want. We'll have a section on that. But uh, the fact that, yeah, she, so so Scripture, this is the interesting part, that Scripture, by the inspiration you know, of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> records a dream which, of course, is in the, the, what, conscious or subconscious of an individual. So the actions of the dream, then, aren't literally played out. They're, they're in her mind. The dream is in her mind. So the actions of verses 1 through 4, that she goes chasing around the city looking for her boyfriend, is all part of the dream, which, of course, suggests She what? She misses him deeply, deeply. And maybe she she regretted sending him away. But bear in mind the fact that this was night after night. uh, The dream has occurred during this winter season when they were apart and and didn't see each other. So I'd also draw your attention, please, to page 10. 
in your outlines, because there's another dream that is recorded in, in the Song of Solomon, page 10. And just so you can see that this is an interesting part of Holy Scripture, and it happens then twice. So if you uh, and the page numbers, remember, are on the lower right hand corner of the text. They're too small. But notice that you see uh, just the top part of the page. There are number one, the eighth reflection, Shulamit's troubled dream. And then notice under small letter A, Shulamit speaking, I was sleeping, but my heart kept waking. Has that ever happened to you? And then you went back to sleep and the dream either continued or you had the same features of the dream come again. So again, here's another section where the the actions did not in that sense literally occur. They're in her subconscious, but the Holy Spirit recorded it for us, (laughs) which is kind of amazing. Uh, And don't forget, in the latter days, your young men and your old men will what? Joel, dream dreams and see visions. (laughs) So this is a communication form that God does use. He has ordained it. Um, and, uh, and the prophecy of Joel that began at Pentecost says it will occur yet in the, in the latter days. Okay. All right. So we're back to page uh, six then of our outline again. Um, so I, I, I'm curious then for anybody, have you had dreams where you had concrete people and concrete events occur in the dream? Anybody? Yeah. Like what? What kinds of people, places, or things did you have in a dream? I'm curious. Well, I, I heard my brother because well, he was always mean to me. So in my dream, I threw this plastic thing at him and knocked a huge welt on his chest. No kidding. Yeah, and that was in the dream. Okay. Huh. Well, I had seen a fire when I was oh. young couple blocks away and it was burning and the flames were crazy. And I kept dreaming that our house was on fire. Oh. But I never, I didn't see the flames, but I knew the house was burning and I needed to wake everybody up and get out. Whoa. And I remember in my dream, I was thinking, this has got to be a dream. I'm going to wake myself up. And I woke myself up. You did. <laughs> it was like, it was a dream. And it finally stopped. <laughs> I kept recurring. <laughs> I have tonight for some time. Wow. Interesting. Yep. Larry. I had a dream when my father in law passed away. His, uh, my mother in law predeceased him. And we were at the, their home with the family mm-hmm. overnight. And that night after the funeral, I had a dream where he was about in a casket or something like that. And the mother-in-law says, don't worry, Larry. I'm taking care of him now. And I'll never forget that dream. Oh, my. Yeah, I just, it's something. Yes. Related to the family. Wow. I had that dream that night. Okay. That night. Yeah. That's pretty. So I just wondered. <laughs> yeah. How would, and when I have this type of things, that brings that up to me. It, it brings it up. Yeah. Anybody else? Did you have concrete places or people? Yeah, that uh, that grandma. Okay. She visited me after grandpa passed away too. In a dream. I think I was awake because I had my eyes open. She was sitting on the end of my bed, and I looked at her, and she goes, "Everything's okay." Huh. And she called me Mary Ann. Oh. The only one that called me Mary. Ann. Oh. Okay. So, That's pretty yeah. specific. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she went time. visiting to let everybody know. Okay. It was okay. Everything's fine. Okay. Wow. Interesting, right? Should should we interpret uh, dreams, uh, the parts of a dream literally? Should we interpret them literally? <laughs> this is the hard part then of this part of Holy Scripture. It's such a unique part of communication, you know, in I God's word. Why was that dream that dream? Yeah, why was that dream that dream? And the pieces of it and the, and the parts of it. So perhaps we'll talk about that a little bit. If you do have your Bible with you, turn with me to Job 33. Job, you know, we'll take uh, tonight a couple of glances at Holy Scripture on some of these key things. Again, because it's such a unique text um, and we rarely, you know, encounter these here in, in uh, wisdom literature, right? The Song of Solomon, Job 33, if you found it. 
um, this is one of the friends of uh, Job who is speaking in this text. I'm going to start at, at verse uh, 14. And, uh, uh, well, I think I'm going to just um, abbreviate some of it just for our time's sake there. Have you found your place? Job 33, 14. Uh, it is interesting mentioning God does speak now one way and now another. And though man may not perceive it, uh, and isn't that the case? Because uh, I wake up in the morning and I go, I know I dream something, but I can't remember a lick of it, which which is a funny thing then about conscious and subconscious. It's like, what was it? I can't even think of anything concrete. But anyway, um, th- this communication of God is interesting. Uh, in a dream, in a vision of night, When deep sleep falls on men as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings. I just thought it was a really concrete description of of some of the variety of God's communication uh, from this particular text. Um, We'll go only that far in that one. And then Joel 2.28, we already mentioned that uh, prophetically in the last days, your old men and your young men will dream dreams and see visions that God will even communicate uh, in those means um, in our latter days. Right. So now let's look at, uh, let's look at her dream. Look at your text, please. The Fruchtenbaum text page six. And uh, what words are repeated uh, in the dream of, of just verses one through four, the part that you can see on, on page six, what words did you see or hear repeated? Uh, I saw it, I saw it. Yeah, the, the, the verb of seeking or sought uh, appears in, in uh, verse uh, one, two times, in verse two, two times, right? What else do you see repeated in the forward? Him, 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 him. Okay, him, yes. Um, so, of course, the, the object of whom she's seeking, yep. Uh, what else repeated? Yeah, f- found. I found him, or I, I, you know, find him. So verse one, she doesn't find him. Verse two, she doesn't find him. Verse three, it's interesting in the in the poem. Then the the issue of finding Solomon changes in that the watchmen find her, but the verb was used again in verse three. You know, the watchman found me. And then in verse four, uh, the verb uh, she found him is there. And any other phrases or words repeated? Oh, my soul loves. Yes. Isn't that precious? That little phrase, uh, my soul loves. And the fact that here using instead of heart, soul. And, you know, for the Hebrew, um, you know, it, it, it's the guts of me, my inner being. Uh, The word soul, you know, in other words, God, you know, pushed the dirt together and breathed into it. uh, And man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. God breathed. So the, you know, my internal, where where my emotions and my will and all those things come together. And she uses that in verses one, two, three, and four, doesn't she? My soul uh, loved, right? My soul loved. And so this is um, her expression for Solomon. And the the uh, Hebrew for each one of those in verses one two three four for uh, for loves whom my soul loved my soul loves my soul loves is uh, the Hebrew word ahava um, a h a v a h if you've been uh, keeping up with the three different uh, words uh, that the Hebrew uses for love in this this is equivalent to the Greek agape and has to do with being committed. Uh, to love, right? From the depths of her soul, whom my soul is committed to. So, and she's got separation anxiety. <laughs> uh, don't forget that the, the dream is occurring before she told him, go back to work, Solomon, you know? <laughs> so you can't really say she made a mistake and she's correcting it because again, the sequence of our text is always interesting uh, in this. But uh, this, all, all four times, my soul loves, my soul is committed to him. And this is in the courtship phase, which tells us 
uh, you know, also about courtship in, in the Jewish context, it was pretty much uh, equivalent to what we say is marriage uh, today. Uh, but it, you know, it wouldn't jump the gun as far as enjoying the privileges of marriage in the commitment of courtship. Um, thus, Joseph, who is committed in his soul to marry, right, and discovers that she is, this is serious. So now this is adulterous, you know, in his understanding, right? You violated the commitment. So even before Joseph and Mary were married and came together, it was, a, a, it, you know, the legal process of divorce would have been followed because, you know, she's an adulteress in this sense. Can you imagine that stoning her and, and Jesus, the son of God, you know, would have been killed. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> the, the angels stopped that from happening. Thank goodness. Right. The communication of God uh, through the angel. But it, it, it is a special thing whom my soul is committed to. And of course, this leads to marriage. Right. A young couple who is committed to one another, who are forsaking all others. We're not playing the field. We're not going to dating sites. You know, we're not um, uh, looking to see if there's a better offer. <laughs> right. There's a commitment prior to marriage, which leads them uh, to that. And uh, for for our uh, married couples in the room, I hope you're thinking of that time in your dating and or courtship, you know, whatever term you might have used at that time. And there was a point where you go, he's it, she's it. Right. And the dream, of course, is kind of laying out there the fact that she misses him uh, and wishes that they could be together. But the winter time uh, is here in Israel and whatever Solomon was doing, taking care of things in Jerusalem and, and she's apart from him. So I, I, I love the, the, uh, the noun soul then, even though often we find heart whom my heart loves uh, that relates. I mean, we use that expression probably more so than we say my soul loves, uh, but the term soul, as far as this deep longing for something I love in the Psalms, uh, 42, verse 2, my soul thirsts for the living God, right? For a believer who's deeply in love and committed to Jesus Christ, Psalm 42, verse 2, my soul, my, all of my inner being thirsts for the living God, right? So the same uh, words and terms, um, um, used there. So, all right, well, let's look a little bit at the pieces of, of the dream then that we have here. So upon my bed night after night, uh, so she has these multiple nights. Um, so the dream is occurring before she kicked him out uh, last night in chapter two, verse 17. And uh, she's uh, seeking him earnestly two times in verse one, you see the desire, but she didn't find him. So the disappointment of being absent, you know, from him, that expression, I didn't find in verse two, I'll rise up and I'll seek him again. She's determined and committed to him right in the dream uh, and the, the active verbs of getting up and I'm going to seek him. It's like this. I'll, I'll take the risk of going into the city as a young gal looking for the one her soul desires She'll take the risk and she's going to expend effort, you know, in the dream again to find him. So in verse two, uh, interesting, she's got a grid plan here of the city. She's going to go throughout the city, throughout the markets. Um, can, can you picture, uh, you know, all of the stalls where, you know, people with produce and animals and so forth are all lined up in the city square. That's where you did your shopping. That was your Walmart. You know, back then. So she's going to look for him there uh, in the city, the markets and the streets. So the extent of her search in the dream, she's going all throughout uh, town. And again, verse two, the disappointment. I didn't find him. You know, the refrain, you know, I didn't find him. Right. So I I'm wondering for anybody here, how far have you gone to close the gap between you and your beloved. Have you ever had a time when you're separated? Military service, uh, job opportunity that moved, you know, before you were married, while you were married. Uh, anybody care to share? Um, what 
what did you have to do to navigate times when you were separated or apart? Anybody? My, we bought uh, a farm right up here in August. And in October, my, we were living in Milwaukee. In October, my husband he came home and he goes, well, I quit my job. I'm going up north. <laughs> okay. Oh. Well, I had a good job. I didn't want to go. And Jen was in high school and had friends. And so we were, I didn't, Jen and I didn't move up here until February. So we were basically separated for three and a half months. Three and a half months. That was a long three and a half well, months. We'd come up here okay. A weekend or something. So yeah, we'd come up here every other weekend. Wow. Yeah, okay. Three and a half months. That was long. That was long. But the commitment to come up, you know, the, the, you exerted the effort to be together and it kind of parallels this, doesn't it? Yeah. Anybody else? Well, John was in Vietnam for a year. Okay. And so And you were already married? Yes. Yeah. Most of it. And anyways, we went to Hawaii in January for R and R, so I went from oh. here over there and in Vietnam. A year. The last guy off the bus. The last, okay, and you remember that? Oh, yeah. The last guy off the bus. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, like he didn't make the bus. Oh. Wow. Okay. Hawaii. Okay, you remember, you can picture him exactly. Wow. A anyone else? Things you've had to do to close the gap? Well, the, one of the hard things with the one, um, when I was in Lebanon um, for five and a half months, in a way, um, she had recently, we had recently had our daughter, uh, gave birth prior to going, and a um, well, few months prior. But the hardest thing, I think, was um, snail mail. Uh, oh. I mean, it, letters were like two weeks behind. Two weeks, okay. It would take two weeks to get a letter. She wrote it to get you. Wow. And then you you feel so helpless because <laughs> you know it's something that's like, man, I'm like, I can't be there to change it or to, help to address it or to help it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, um, it was difficult at times. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you persevered and you got through. Anyone else with a story of how to close the gap or how you worked in your relationship to close a gap? We didn't really have any lengthy separation, but just one that was very difficult. Mm. Um, when we were living in Oldfield and the tornado hit us, oh. um, I was at home and he was at, in Fond du Lac. And so then by the time he got back to Oldfield, the perimeter had been shut off mm. and they would only allow people in as far as the high school. And there was naturally no phone, no way yeah. to figure out, is she still trapped in the house? Right. Where are the kids? You know, and then wow. once you got into the high school, they, they wouldn't allow him to mm. leave, you know. So he snuck so out, out the back, back, back door. door. Wow. Said, I can't wait anymore. And at that time, um, yeah, myself and daughter and those that were in our house, our relatives, uh -huh. um, had found our way. We were coming down the backfield, so we met. Okay, you and met. Behind wow. <laughs> Talk about an anxious, yeah, time and period, yeah, not knowing who's alive and who's not. Yeah. So, well, maybe you just stood in her shoes a little bit, right? She's she's longing for the one her soul loves and is anxious to uh, find him. Look at verse 3 in your, your text then. Uh, verse 3, the watchmen, I love this term, right? The watchmen that go around the city found me. And, you know, what was the purpose of watchmen in, uh, in ancient Old Testament cities? Uh, like a security force, a police force, right? The nighttime guards. Anybody ever do nighttime guard duty? Right? In military. In, in, in military. Okay. So here you've got it. But, you know, I love the term watchman. It's so rich, you know, in uh, Old Testament, you know, language. Um, so, yeah, security force. Um, and uh, Psalm 130 is one of my favorites using the same term, Psalm 130, verse 6. You know, I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. 
more than watchmen wait for the morning. Now, how long, I mean, what's it like for a watchman to wait for the morning? He's a guy standing on a rampart somewhere looking into the dark. And if you had some, last night I had some beautiful stars, by the way. Um, If you had some starlight, that helped. But a watchman is staring into the dark, waiting for, you know, the first glimpse of dawn, you know, to come up because then his shift would change or whatever. And so the psalmist uses that picture of uh, the believer, you know, committed to God who's waiting, you know, for the Lord's uh, blessing or so forth. Did I see a hand or a? I was watching him at a factory. Okay. uh, Whatever. And um, on Saturday nights, I would would go in, uh, I think it was 6 o'clock, and I worked until 6 o'clock Sunday morning. Okay. And and so between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock, was interminably long. Between three and six. Yeah, yeah. That, trying that. to keep the eyes open <laughs> and, and stay awake and alert. Okay. Yeah, alert. Yeah. And and not turn into the uh, the uh, guards, you know, the Roman guards who were guarding the tomb of Jesus and and uh, fell asleep, you know, and then they, they concocted a story and lied. It's like, you know, the disciples stole them away. Well, if you were asleep, how is it that you knew the disciples stole the body? Yeah, it's just so. But there you are. There's the proof of it. There, there I had to go around with the fact that they had different locations where I had to clock in. Okay. 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 Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. Well, watching and waiting for the morning, right? Um, there, there's an occasion where the watchmen come up again, and this will strike you as like, oh, this is really odd. But if you uh, turn, uh, please, to uh, page 10 of your outline, we're going to see the watchmen of the city come up again. And uh, what unusual thing happens to her, Shulamit, uh, at the, the last verse on page 10? Relative to the watchman, did you find it in your outline? Yeah, what happened? Oh, yes. Yeah, they hit her. They beat her up. It's like, wait a minute. This, I mean, the heroine of the whole story? How can you get away with this? So that's coming relative to the watchman. We won't uh, address that particular issue now. But um, here, uh, she sees the watchman and certainly... They, of all people, the security guard for the whole city will know where her the, the loved one, the beloved of her soul would be, right? They're the ones who are going to know, right? And so she's pretty confident, you know, of that. Uh, but in the end, uh, they, they don't know where he is either. They haven't seen him either. So again, her desire is growing. Uh, the intensity of that we see. And finally, verse four, the last verse on uh, page six, um, uh, So scarcely had she passed from them. She's just about ready to give up. And she found, there's your verb again, found, uh, the one whom my soul loves, the expression for Solomon. And uh, she seizes him and would not let him go. That, you know, reminds me of some of those great pictures between, you know, military guys and their gals, you know, the old pictures that you see from you know, World War, you know, one or two or whatever, and she's hanging on for dear life, right? Or he's leaning out of the train window and she's grabbing on for one more kiss um, kind of a thing. So she she finds him and with great energy, right, she grabs hold of him and brings him then uniquely into her mother's house. Don't forget to, you know, the dreams are occurring as she's an unmarried gal at this point. She's still... Uh, living at home with uh, mom and into the chambers of the one who gave me birth. Uh, So the question is, what in all the world is she doing with him in verse four? And uh, there's several ways that uh, uh, commentators go on this one. So um, why, why would she bring anybody, any guesses here? Why would she, I mean, why does she seize him? And not let him go and brings him into her mother's house. What's going on in this picture? It actually is really cool. It really is. Anybody? Any thoughts on that? So, part, yeah, we're still in the dream here. 
right? That at least, you know, some satisfaction is, is gotten here. But the question is, yeah, why does she bring him uh, into the bedroom? Now, most folks, as you turn the page, please turn the page to verse five. So we're on page seven, the, the verse five at the top. We've already seen this little refrain once in the song. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, a reference to the the, the uh, virgins who are of marriage age, but weren't picked by Solomon, right? We've met these gals, this group of gals, and, uh, and Shulamit becomes kind of a mentor to them, even throughout the whole song. And she puts them under oath by the gazelles and by the hinds of the field that you don't arouse or stir up love until it's pleased. Uh, we had this verse previously. Uh, at chapter two, verse seven, the same verse we've had it. So we're going to, we're going to do a little observation, uh, work right now, um, uh, to understand what's going on in this text. Why does in the dream, why is she bringing him into, uh, her mother's house and perhaps even her mother's bedroom? It, it seems to suggest, of course, something of, of intimacy going on. If you'll turn back, please, to page four. Four of your outline. Again, don't forget, look at the small page number at the lower right. So page four of your outline. And keep your, your hands at our current text, you know, page, page uh, seven. Um, so previously we saw the last two verses on page four. Everybody find their Actually, there's a pattern here in the poetry that's super important. If you do want to you know, write notes all over this section, it's important. We looked at verse 6 when we studied this part of the text uh, uh, near the bottom of page 4. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. So as a sexual position on their wedding night, and then comes the oath. Uh, that you see there, uh, verse 7 at the bottom of page 4, the same thing that we have here tonight. So many commentators want to believe that in the dream, you know, she's uh, becoming intimate with her boyfriend because of the, the oath, which is the same. But you'll notice that the expression or the picture of the two of them embracing in verse six on page four is not found in our text tonight. I, uh, that's a point which is obvious, right? The, the position of, the, of him and her together embracing a sexual position is not in our text tonight. Now, this oath again appears on page 15. And I do want you to, you know, keep your finger then where we're at now. Keep your finger there. But now find page 15 of the outline. And on page 15, oh, very conveniently, it's at the bottom of the page again. The oath uh, that she puts the unmarried girls under is at the bottom of the page. Same oath. Uh, you know, why would you arouse or stir up love until it's pleased, until God's timing for it? And you notice right above it, verse 3, which uh, is in, uh, uh, where are we in there? Chapter um, 8, verse 3 is again the same position of the husband and wife in an intimate embrace. Here's my point. So we saw it in chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, in a marital context, if we went back to our notes, they're, they're at the wedding night in chapter 2, verse 7, and enjoying their one flesh union on the wedding night. Here again, uh, we, we are in that type of a context. They're in a married context in uh, uh, page 15, uh, verses 3 and 4. But when you go back to our work for tonight, they're not in a wedded context. 
Thus, the expression, his left hand is under me and his right hand pulls me close, is not found. Therefore, I contend that this is not a sexual dream uh, in that sense. And there's a better biblical answer to why is she bringing her boyfriend into the mother's house? Well, why not? She's unmarried and into the mother's bedroom or chamber. See, there's where it's like, okay, how are you going to argue this way? And this is how we uh, look at sacred scripture to interpret for us. Uh, And we're going to Genesis 24, Genesis 24, where the exact same expression of I brought him into the house of my mother and into the chamber of the one who gave me birth is found in Genesis 24, verse 67. You'll want to glance at it yourself and you'll go, oh, see, this is let scripture interpret scripture. I mean, I can tell you what I believe is going on in the verse, but let scripture teach us, right? And so did, did you find it? Genesis 24, 67. This is Isaac and Rebecca. And what does he do in Genesis 24, 67? He brings her into his mother's room or tent and the wedding occurs. So I, I think that verse is the interpretation then of where we're at on page six. She brings him into the mother's chamber because this was uh, one of the, the Jewish steps for the wedding to take place. Or, in other words, mom, because, you know, we know dad is not in the song anywhere. Her father is never in the song. Uh, so, in other words, mom, this is the one. I want to marry him. And in the mother's chamber, she gets her mother's blessing and her mother's um, approval because there's no father. So, uh, but you know what? Take take uh, eight out of 10 books, commentaries on this, and they'll say, no, nah, she's having sex in the dream. And, and why else would she bring the boyfriend into the mother's bedroom because they wanted to have that. But I believe scripture interprets it for us this way. She's getting her mother's <laughs> approval for the wedding. Does that help everybody? It's it, it, again, we have to look at the things that are repeated in the, in the poem, right? And what's not repeated tonight is the, his left hand is under me and his right hand pulls me close. That's what is not in the text tonight. Therefore, I believe that this event is, is the uh, sanctioning the family, uh, sanctioning the marriage. So anybody, does that help? I hope I didn't muddy that. Um, but again, uh, I, I would dare say uh, many of your Bible footnotes on these verses are probably going to say that they're being intimate in this point. And I, I, I would disagree, but I hope you have uh, the bi- biblical uh, tools now, you know, with which, you know, to understand the text, I believe, as Scripture would interpret it. Okay. So, uh, so this is interesting. Why the oath? Actually, we're on the top of page seven, friends. Why the oath? Yeah, be, you know, because she's still putting her her young uh, virgin unmarried gals under the oath, no sex before marriage. And in fact, she practices what she preaches. So if I've taught this correctly, right, that this is not a sexual encounter of him and her in the mother's bedroom, she's practicing what she's preaching to the young virgins. uh, And she puts them under oath. Wait for sex in marriage. That's what she's saying in verse five, top of page seven. Wait, wait, I adjure you, right? Um, And remember by the gazelles or by the hinds, do you remember why she uses animals in the oath to stay pure? In other words, gals, stay pure. Don't give your sexuality away to any boy at any time in any place. Do you remember why why we think she uses the 
the animal pictures I, I, by the gazelles and by the hinds. Anybody? Please. Because it sounds like... We, we believe that that's the sense of it. That they, they, you know, it wasn't proper to use, you know, Yahweh in an oath for a Jew to use the sacred name of God. So they used two words in, in the whole country uh, picture, pastoral picture, which sound like the Lord of hosts and uh, the God of armies and the Lord Sab- Sabaoth and so forth. So gazelles and hinds, those Hebrew words sound like those names of God. Was this, was this their way of saying gosh and golly? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, where we, right. Yeah, it certainly could have been, right? Because they used Hebrew words here that sounded like, in other words, the seriousness of the oath, the seriousness of it. They heard the holy name of God, the Lord of hosts, when she said, by the gazelles and by the hinds. And don't stir up love. In other words, you know, the, the, the great yet silly question, you know, young teenagers in love ask, how far can I go? Wrong question. How far can I stay away is the oath. Right. To be pure. Uh, and that's what she puts uh, them under the oath for. It's kind of worrying them about uh, temptation of their desire. Their yeah. Desire. Yes. Still. Yes. Don't 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 add to the flame. Right. Don't, don't do anything because, yeah, that certainly will come. But at its right place and, and its right time. All right. So I think part of the answer, you know, to the whole going into the bedroom, right? They're setting the they're setting the date of the wedding. She's saying, "Mom, you know, what day can I can we have the wedding? You know, we're you know, and because there that's the family tree. The mother is the only one who's left here, as far as that goes. Thank goodness the 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 brothers aren't or the half brothers aren't in the picture. So um, yeah." She's practicing in courtship what she preaches to the virgins. So, um, you know what? Just a couple of little applications that we're going to go to the second half of the text. Uh, everybody knows the expression absence makes. Have you used it before? That expression? I guess it's uh, credited to a Roman poet named Sextus in 15 B.C. <laughs> Are you up on your Roman poetry? Sextus. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Well, we, we see her earnestness, her love for, you know, Solomon in, the, in this particular text. It really is kind of a cool thing. We've talked about, you know, being absent from your uh, loved one for periods of time and how it worked out. But I honestly think that the purpose of the dream in Holy Scripture. What's the purpose of the text for us? It shows us, it shows us what committed love looks like in action, even though these actions didn't literally happen. They're in a dream. But notice she does not go to any other, well, so much for this guy, I'll pick him. You know, she goes extensively through the whole city street grid plan. She asks the watchman who should know anybody and everybody who is up and awake at that hour and night. Where's the one whom my soul loves? So this whole thing seems to me to be illustrating what a committed, devoted love looks like. And in the wedding vow, forsaking all others. And keeping him or her only to myself as long as we both shall live. I, I think that's the purpose of the dream. Otherwise, we'd get Freud in here and ask him to psychoanalyze the dream. And he'd say, yeah, they're going at it in the mother's bedroom. And we'd all go, so why did the Holy Spirit put that in there? You know? But the earnestness of it and the exclusiveness of the relationship, she's not picking one of the watchmen. She's not giving up on him. But the, her heart's desire, which I believe, uh, as, as you uh, married couples would account for, that God births that kind of a desire. 
uh, between a man and a woman. God put that in you to desire your, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whom you married. God did that. That's a gift of grace. Um, and, and this is illustrated for us, you know, in a really, really, really unique way. So she's fiercely loyal. Do we, we don't even use terms like that anymore, do we? She's fiercely loyal. She will not even look at anybody else in the whole city. And when she finds him, she gives him the bear hug of bear hugs, right? And she won't let go. See, there's that fierceness of loyalty and a commitment. And if we were making a spiritual application, which is what, you know, uh, is, is appropriate at this point, this is God's love for you who is fiercely loyal to you and will not let you go. So my understanding of the security of salvation is, is in this kind of a picture where God in Jesus Christ grabbed you and won't let you go. He's not going to, you know, that enough of you. I'm going, you know, with another person. This is God's love. It's a loyal love, right? God's love is committed to us, right? While we were yet sinners, right? He grabbed hold of us in Christ. And, you know, I hope those kinds of uh, themes are meaningful for us as well, too. It's a covenant, right? Marriage is always a covenant. One man and one woman both being equally broken, saying, let's do life together because there's more for us to do together than it is if we stay apart, right? So, well, I don't know if you've got grandchildren or great-grandchildren, you'll share that with as far as courtship you know, someday, but, you know, the picture of a fierce loyalty, I, I, I think the Holy Spirit, you know, gave us a powerful text, right? So, well, should we go on to the next uh, section, shall we? we? We've only got a few verses left tonight. See, we're going to cover a whole chapter, which is really interesting. So, friends, you're on page seven, right? We're at capital letter C, the third idol, marital Union Reflections. This is a very long section in the heart of the song itself from chapter 3 through chapter 5, you can see there, or the first part of chapter 5. And then number uh, 1, the sixth reflection, the wedding procession. And I've got a couple of little summaries that kind of hopefully help us thinking about these verses again. So the third idol that we're entering into tonight, remember, that, that's a fancy term for a division of the poem, I-D-Y-L-L. Fancy, uh, you know, for uh, the division. And there are five major divisions of the Song of Solomon. So we've already entered into the third one tonight, uh, even though we're not <laughs> halfway through the book, right? Um, but uh, the way these are outlined. So we're in that. And this third idol is the connecting link between idols one and two, which we've just completed. In idol number one, uh, it dealt with the wedding banquet. Do you remember how the poem opened? Can you remember back a couple of weeks? The wedding banquet began the poem. In other words, this, the courtship's over, the marriage ceremony's over, we're in the dinner banquet hall. That's how it started, chapter one, verse uh, one. And uh, and then followed by the wedding night. Um, that was in the first idol. Now, in the second idol, which we just finished, uh, describes an earlier time of courtship. So remember, the idols are not chronologically in order. So what we just finished was a picture of their unmarried dating time period. Um, and the second idol described that. Now, the third idol deals with the marital union as far as the wedding takes place. So the wedding ceremony itself, as much as we can see of it, is given to us now in the text that we have tonight. Um, and then it's followed once again by the wedding night. And that won't come until next week. So I'm curious uh, for all our brides, what was the best part of your wedding prep? What was the best part of you preparing as a bride? on your wedding day you made your own wedding dress Ooh, that is cool wow do you still have it no then i turned it into a oh 
Another dress. Into another dress. Yeah. <laughs> that was thrifty. Anybody else? What was the best part of your wedding prep for our brides? Boy, that makes you think. I see people really thinking. That's too far ago to remember, right? Somebody. <laughs> P- picking out the dress. I made my own cake. You made your own cake. That's cool. All right. Anybody? Was it the hair? Was it the makeup, the jewelry? How about for the men? Was it your suit? Was it your tuxedo? Was it driving in a limousine? Anybody? No, no favor. All right, we got one going here. Okay, so that's in Vietnam, and I had no idea when I was going to come home to get married. Oh, I had to wait for your orders. Oh, sure. When I got the orders, yeah. she was planning the wedding and the date and everything, and then I had. Nine days from the time I got to California to get married and get back to Vietnam. <laughs> Nine days. Yeah. Get it all in. Yeah, I got home. She had the wedding plan. I went to the wedding. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's probably it because you just had no particular part in it except showing up. Huh? <laughs> that was brilliant. That's <laughs> When he came home. Okay. Well, here in this section, again, we see uh, the, the, the ceremony itself. And number one on your outlines, then top of page seven, the sixth reflection. There are 13 reflections total uh, in this. So, you know, we're, we're nearing at least closer to halfway. The wedding procession is what we're seeing as we close our text out tonight. The wedding procession itself. So I, I love this text as much as the, the dream and seeing the loyalty aspect and why the Holy Spirit wanted us to understand what loyalty, you know, to one man, one woman marriage, right? Because now the whole world is is just gone nuts with all kinds of other paradigms of marriage, but the loyalty and and such. So um, it, in, in the ancient system of marriage, especially in the Jewish world, there were five distinct steps that were followed. And I want to outline those for you here, and you can jot whatever notes are meaningful to you. There are five distinct steps that are followed in a Jewish wedding. The first, number one, so pick any blank paper if you like, is the betrothal. The betrothal was the first of five distinct steps in uh, a Jewish wedding. This is the time when the arrangement uh, for the marriage was contracted by the parents of the bride and groom. Is it possible anybody here, your marriage was arranged by your parents? Is it possible? Probably not. Yeah, I don't see anybody saying that. Anybody on Zoom, did you have an arranged marriage? Probably not. Nope. Uh, Yeah, I see heads shaking there as well too. In the Jewish world, it was common. The parents arranged uh, the marriage, um, and uh, sometimes it was arranged years in advance. Um, so Hosea chapter 3, verse 2, in my notes, a bride price was determined between the parents. The bride price, uh, which was what we would call today what? Equivalent to a, a dowry. That was part of it based on the uh, the bride and her family's uh, wealth. Um, and it may have been a lot or it may not have been a lot. So in uh, the song tonight, the verses we have left, we will only see the commitment between the bride and groom, such as we just saw in the dream. We only see that commitment uh, between them. And then in the fourth reflection, which is back at page five, um, we especially uh, see the commitment. If you don't mind, I'm sorry, uh, looking at page six, it should be uh, at chapter two, verse 16, the commitment to them. I sure hope I got the right number there. Page six is chapter two. Oh, sure. At the top of page six, the little expression uh, in verse 16, my lover is mine and I am his Here's the commitment, uh, you know, in the the, the uh, context of, of um, you know, that they have with each other. We see that commitment. And then she running all over town looking for him. 
and don't forget Matthew 118 in the New Testament. Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. She was pledged already. See, the betrothal had taken place when the gospel accounts open. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two in a Jewish wedding is the wedding procession. The wedding procession. This was accomplished when the groom went to the house of the bride to bring her or to send a wedding party to bring her to his home in a festal procession. And he would go out also to meet her. And that's what we're going to see tonight in the closing verses of chapter three, the wedding procession. It was a big deal. Now, I mean, we typically just focus at, you know, the back of the church to the altar in the front as the procession. But this involved miles of travel sometimes to bring her from Galilee to Jerusalem was uh, (coughs) miles and hours in the wedding procession. And I do want you to look at another scripture, which is a rare gem, Psalm 45. Turn in your Bibles, please, Psalm 45. This is a Messianic psalm, but it's also a wedding psalm, Psalm 45 in your Bibles. It, it's a gold mine, and it parallels the text that we have left uh, tonight in the wedding procession. Um, so find your place in Psalm 45, and I'm going to just pinpoint several of the verses of this psalm it just it's another one that just probably never gets preached um but here it's a wedding psalm a jewish wedding psalm and a royal psalm look at verse three gird your sword upon your side O mighty one clothe yourself with splendor and majesty that was part of the procession and we're going to see that there are 60 mighty men with swords who are guarding the uh, bride-to-be's carriage, okay? Then let your eye drop to verse 6. Verse 6 is the messianic part that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse uh, 8 and 9 is quoted uh, there. So we're going to just pass over that book for now. Verse 8, all of your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Uh, Those uh, perfumes are going to be mentioned in the text tonight. Verse 9, at your right hand is the royal bride, and she's in gold of Ophir. We're going to see the gold tonight in the text. Verse 11, the king is enthralled by your beauty, right? We've seen that all throughout the song. Honor him, for he is your Lord. Verse 13, please, drop down to 13. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. Can you imagine the opulence of that kind of a wedding dress? Right? With strands of gold uh, interwoven. Verse 14, please. In, In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. See the procession of the wedding. Her virgin companions follow her and are brought to you. So the the choir that we see in the song, the virgin gals are there. And finally, verse 15, they are led with joy and gladness. They enter the palace of the king. We'll stop there. But the expressions of joy and gladness is what closes chapter three tonight. The, The joy and gladness of Solomon in seeing his bride in her radiance and glory. And the opulence that Solomon um, created for his bride in in her gown uh, and in the carriage or uh, the coach that she's coming in. So uh, we're in the wedding procession. Uh, you, You know, this same theme, this Jewish theme, we're in the second of five parts to a Jewish wedding. The, the wedding procession is used extensively in the New Testament. Matthew, anybody? Do you know where or how? The wedding procession? Anybody? Just in case. Revelation. Uh, in, in Revelation, you'll find it there as well, too. In Matthew 25, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. 
The wedding procession is in Matthew 25. Five of the virgins were wise and five were foolish. So the same theme of the virgins, the unmarried ones, who are looking into the glory of marriage. Uh, we see that there. And uh, verse 5, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. There's a distance, you know, between the bride and the groom meeting at where the ceremony would take place. Verse 6 of Matthew 25, at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. So the whole parable of the, the virgins is based even on the Old Testament song and uh, Psalm 45 text, of course, that we, we just need to uh, better ourselves in. And this one is my favorite of favorites of favorites. John 14 describes the wedding procession which will occur for us who are in Christ. Does anybody know the text of John 14? In my father's house. See, you, the, the groom, would, would build a room onto your parents' house, and then you'd go to bring your bride in procession to the ceremony, and then, you know, the, the, so that your family grew and grew it. It grew large because you built a room. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there, Jesus says. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what? I'm coming back in procession to bring you to be where I am. That's the whole wedding procession of Christ and the church. This is why we understand why we want to impose those applications in this song, even though the song isn't teaching that. So John 14 teaches the wedding procession, and Christ is building the mansions, King James, for his believers to be living and dwelling in, thus the book of Revelation. And he's coming back and in procession to take us, the bride, the church, to be with him where he's at. Anybody ready tonight? <laughs> Isn't that powerful? That's all based on the Jewish uh, sequence of um, how a Jewish wedding works. So number one, uh, you know, we covered already then the betrothal. Number two, the wedding uh, procession. Uh, so number three, the third part of a Jewish wedding is the ceremony itself, the wedding ceremony itself, in which the two are recognized to be husband and wife in a legal sense. Um, so this aspect uh, is in the background in the first reflection, which was uh, chapter one of our song. And it will be found tonight in the sixth reflection, the verses that we have to conclude the wedding ceremony itself. We see mostly the procession, but then we see the bride and the groom, you know, come together. And uh, we really don't see much of the element of the ceremony itself, but that's the third aspect. Number four, the fourth aspect of a Jewish wedding is the wedding feast. After your ceremony, you went to the banquet hall, correct? And some of you took limos, Right. Some of you went to parks and had pictures taken, you know, till all the guests arrived at the wedding feast. So the wedding feast, this follows the ceremony and it's found in the second reflection. So in chapter one, we already saw the feast. Remember, she's seated with him on a, on a couch reclining at the banquet table. And uh, we saw that wedding feast already. So that was on page three while the king was at the banquet table. But um, this is beautifully the wedding feast, Old Testament and New Testament extensively uses the picture of the wedding feast extensively. So Isaiah chapter 25, verse six, on this mountain, there will be a great feast of the finest of aged wines and meats. That's the wedding feast that we'll have with Jesus. Remember in, in the Christian bookstores, when there was such a thing as a Christian bookstore, and they had those beautiful pictures of the infinity picture of the table looking from the end of it, you know, and we are seated with Christ at that table. Um, and Matthew chapter eight, verse 11, uh, we will feast with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding banquet. 
Luke 12, verse 36, the master returns from the wedding banquet. Luke 13, verse 29, we will feast in the kingdom of God. Luke 14, the parable of the great banquet. The Gospels extensively looked at the fourth part of the whole Jewish wedding, the fourth part extensively. And then the book of Revelation in chapter 19, the bride is ready and, uh, you know, blessed are all those who are invited into the wedding banquet. And don't forget, you need the garments because there was the man who did not have the white robe of Christ's righteousness. He was kicked out. Uh, we need Christ's garment for that. And then finally, the fifth thing is the wedding night. The wedding night when the couple becomes one flesh, according to Genesis, right? And this is seen already uh, in chapter 2, verse 6. His left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. So the wedding night, we've already seen it and we'll see it again um, uh, next week uh, in our scripture, okay? So now the verses we're going to cover here then uh, uh, briefly, then just the summary to bring together what I've, I've just said. The sixth reflection, if you're looking on page seven, there's a description of the elegant wedding procession sent by Solomon. In view of the second step of the Jewish marriage system, Solomon sent a wedding party from Jerusalem to Galilee to get Shulamet, his bride, for the wedding ceremony in Jerusalem. And we see the wedding party approaching Jerusalem with the bride in her midst. And the, the groom and the bride converge then in the city in this uh, little set of verses that, that we have here, right? So now just skim so that you can refresh yourself with the verses we're looking at on page 7, verses 6 through 11. Who's all part of the wedding procession? Who's all part of the wedding procession? Skim it so you can see all the people involved. And that way, um, okay, so you see Solomon's name mentioned a couple times. Yep, we see 60 mighty men, which is what? What are they? What's their purpose? They're, they're, they're security. They're guards. They're green beret. They're Marines. They're what, what other term do we give to them? I mean, they're the elite. Airborne. Airborne, but they're not jumping at this point. Yeah, no parachutes here at this one. Who else is in the procession? Okay, where's the bride? Oh, okay. Who else? Anybody else in the procession? Don't forget in verse 11, there's the choir or the, uh, the daughters. Remember the virgin daughters who are looking in, who um, Shulamit is mentoring, right? So the question is, where's the bride? Where's the bride? Okay. Folks, here, here's the, you know, I, I never finished. Uh, somebody asked me what's the you know, best English translations that we can use. And, and I never finished that answer. So I must have had a pregnant you know, moment that night when that was. And you remember what I said, though? Do you remember what I said? Because nobody ever questioned me about that. Yeah. Remember what I said? The best translation is Hebrew and Greek. And tonight... The only way you will find the bride in the text is if you've studied Hebrew because you don't see her name and you don't see uh, the, a pronoun used for her, you know, my beloved or some, something like that. But if you will look at verse six, this is the only way. And I can't tell you how many, I mean, six or seven out of 10 commentaries will biff this because they don't know Hebrew. The commentaries that don't know Hebrew. The question, verse 6, who is this one? Female. It's female. It's feminine in the Hebrew text. There's the bride. But by the English, you wouldn't know who that was. Who is this one? It's feminine. It's a demonstrative pronoun, this one, in verse 6. Also, the participle coming up. The participle, this verbal adjective, has to agree with what it modifies. So if, if it's a feminine subject who is this one, the verb itself has to agree with it. So the verb coming up is feminine. It's pointing to the bride. Who is this gal, this 
gal coming up from the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed. The verb perfumed or the participle is also feminine because she's highly perfumed. So the bride is in verse 6, verse 7, and verse 8. That's the bride. The groom then, verses 9, verses 10, and verse 11, because of the, the, the uh, you know, his name appears, but hers doesn't. And again, your commentaries, check them out, and they're not worth their, their weight if, if they say this is not the bride. It's a feminine uh, a demonstra- demonstrative pronoun, okay? Here's the, here's the bride coming in verses 6, 7, and 8. So it's interesting, three verses addressing her and then three verses addressing him. And so there's kind of this parallelism, bride and groom, okay? Does that help everybody? But again, we wouldn't know that unless we looked at the Hebrew because her name isn't here, and it's not like it's missing. Uh, everything is translated correctly, but this one is referring to uh, the bride coming up. All right. So she's not quite visible yet. So uh, the daughters of Jerusalem are, are peering at the royal uh, procession coming, and they can't quite see who's in it because it, she's still far off, right? Her name isn't mentioned. Uh, it, this is spoken by somebody in the crowd uh, in Jerusalem or, or the virgins themselves, and she's coming up. Again, that was a feminine verb and coming up literally because you remember jerusalem is on a mountain so when you approach jerusalem you are always going uphill and when you went to jerusalem three times a year for your um required feasts what did you do when you went up to jerusalem you sang the song of ascent which are Psalm 112 to 130, something like that. The songs that they would sing when they went up to Jerusalem are recorded in the book of Psalms. They're like 115 to 120 to 130, somewhere in that ballpark. And when you see it says a Psalm of Ascent, literally, they're going up to the temple and and they're singing these psalms and they see the bride you know who's coming up but they can't quite make her out but what they can see in uh, in verse 6 are pillars of smoke and where else in the old testament was a pillar of smoke so important for the jewish people and who is the pillar of smoke god so they, they use the same term because there's incense that is being burned in and around her uh, royal uh, couch. And it looks like pillars of smoke coming up, this aromatic cloud. I mean, this is really something because in a desert, it's dry and dusty. This poor gal, she's you know wiping the dust off her face the whole time. But the aromatic scent of this whole procession is so exciting. God appears in the theophany of a pillar of cloud, right? So it's regal. Um, And also in Joel chapter 2, the prophecy of um, the end times, there will be blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Same term right there. And and the the, the, uh, aromatic sense of myrrh, we saw that in uh, chapter 1, verse 13, she had a necklace on. Uh, between her breasts, she had a necklace that had myrrh, so it was like perfume uh, for her and, and for Solomon. It came from South Arabia, so it was an exotic traded um, you know, substance. It was used also for anointing elements in the tabernacle and frankincense, which was used kind of like a deodorant or a splash after you took your shower or your bath and you'd, you'd splash on frankincense. Uh, it was used on the altar of incense in the tabernacle. It was lavish. These things are lavish. Um, the, the, the cloud, the pillar of this. And she's on verse 7, what's called a travel couch. This reminds me of my sermon that I, I just had because I think the eunuch is on this kind of a similar thing, which was a box and there's a cushion in it. 
He's royalty, but there's two long poles underneath it. And there's four men who are carrying this travel couch on their shoulders. And that's how she's being brought from Galilee all the way. So this thing doesn't have have uh, wheels on at this point, this travel couch. It's called a mita, M-I-T-A-H in Hebrew. And this is what was sent to get the bride from Galilee, this travel couch. Now, verse 7, who's around the couch? Sixty mighty men. What? You, you have to understand the term mighty men in, Hebrew, in, in, in the Old Testament Jewish context. What are the mighty men? Warriors. Warriors, but these were the elite of the elite. So, who do you call that in our military forces today? Yeah, seals. Seals would be yeah. These are them, and notice that they are um, all um, uh, mighty men of Israel. In verse eight, they're handlers of the sword. They're experienced in combat. They're experts in war, and they have swords on their thighs against any particular fear that would come. And 60 of them, it's interesting, in 2 Samuel 23, verse 39, David only had 37. He didn't even have this many, and Solomon gets these seals. Expert in war to guard this thing. Why? Because of the opulence and the, the fragrance, I mean, it's like, pick this gal off and you've got, you know, a pretty purse. Do, do you see? So all of that, handlers in war, they're experienced with, with probably the short sword at their thigh. Not the long one, you know, used first in combat, but a short sword for, for close personal man-to-man uh, combat at this point. And, and this is the reason. I, I give you tonight unofficial uh, text from the Apocrypha um, on this particular issue. It's like, why did, she, why did they need to protect her with 60 mighty men, 60 seals? So this is from 1 Maccabees. Have you heard of that? You know, this is uh, books that were not included in Holy Scripture, but in your Catholic Bible they are. Yeah. And in the Catholic Church they are. Um, and this is from First Maccabees chapter 9. I can't give you the whole context, but this is interesting about a wedding procession exactly that we're looking at here. Um, so First uh, Maccabees 9.37, here we go. After this came word to Jonathan and Simon, his brother, that the children of Jambri made a great marriage and were bringing the bride from Nababatha with a great Train, as being the daughter of one of the great princes of Canaan. Therefore, they remembered John, their brother, and went up and hid themselves under the covert of the mountain, where they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, there was much ado and great carriage. And the bridegroom came forth and his friends and brethren to meet them with drums and instruments and music and many weapons. Then Jonathan and they that were with him rose up against them from the place where they lay in ambush and made a slaughter of them all in such sort as many fell down dead and the remnant fell, fled into the mountain and they took all their spoils. Thus was the marriage turned into mourning and the noise of their melody into lamentation. It's not biblical. It's just, you know, uh, interesting text. And gives you the background why Solomon dispatches 60 seals to guard the bride that's coming to. I mean, this is opulence and this is, you know, great wealth at this point. Right. So. All right. And uh, so then we see Solomon coming here. Verse nine, then then a bed of state King Solomon had made for himself from the trees of Lebanon, uh, you know, um, cedars didn't grow naturally in Israel, so they imported them from Lebanon. What else did Solomon use cedars from Lebanon for in construction? The temple and his 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 royal palace. So we've seen this before, uh, and now there's this uh, portable type of carriage uh, for him, and the opulence of it, well, the, the, the pillars of it. So there's some posts going up at the four corners of it. They're silver. 
And then when you set this traveling couch down on the ground, it would have four legs, you know, underneath it. And they're made of gold. The cushion inside of Solomon's, you know, traveling uh, procession is made of. And, and why does that strike us um, in, in verse 10? Because uh, purple what was extremely hard to get as a dye. It came from a shell called the Murex shell, M-U-R-E-X. Uh, and it's part of the eastern Mediterranean coastline. You'd have to go to the Mediterranean Sea to get these shells. Um, and in Exodus 26, verse 1, uh, purple was used in the, in the curtains of the tabernacle. I mean, so the opulence of the portable tabernacle. Um, and the high priest wore garments that also were dyed with purple. Uh, but how many does it take to get one ounce of purple dye? Over 10,000 shells to make one ounce. And his couch that he reclined on for, for his ride to the wedding ceremony is dyed with purple. How many ounces do you suppose they collected to, for that? Ten, over 10,000 of these shells. And they grind it, you know, to get you know, that tiny little bit of substance out of this shell, you know, like, like out of an oyster and collect that all uh, and then dye cloth with it. I mean, opulence, folks, <laughs> wealth beyond, you know, uh, who is George, George uh, Be Bezos now is declared the richest man in the world. No, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, George, Jeff, George of the jungle. <laughs> Yeah. So and uh, the daughters of Jerusalem, they got to, they got involved in it as well, too. They got involved. Uh, the tapestries that are in there and, uh, you know, they, they see this beauty and glory and, and wish, of course, that it had been them. So um, then there's an exhortation as we close. Uh, verse 11. We're just about finished then. The exhortation to, to the daughters of Jerusalem. Boy, look at this. <laughs> look at this procession, right? Go forth. Look at it. Uh, um, the daughters of Jerusalem. King Solomon is coming with the crown with which his mother crowned him uh, on the day of his wedding. So this is not a coronation. Uh, in the Jewish culture, men wore crowns at their wedding. Because they, they were pictures then of God. They wore crowns. And uh, who is Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. So she crowns him. This is, again, not a coronation. Jewish uh, kings were not coronated. What were they when they became anointed? Because there is only one king who is God. So a, a Jewish king would not wear a crown. They were anointed Saul. David, Solomon, and so forth. So this is for the wedding itself uh, that they would, uh, and, and she's crowned for, uh, uh, by her mother. On the, and you won't find this in First Kings either. You won't find this. This is only here. There's no uh, recognition of that in First Kings, you know, when Solomon comes to the throne after his father David um, says he's the successor. Uh, and there are no other passages uh, that record in Old Testament scriptures that mothers made the wedding crown, um, the crown of regal stature. Uh, we don't have any others uh, of that. But this custom of crowning Jewish grooms ended in 70 A.D. Why? They were kept to God as their king. And because the temple was now destroyed so you might see in jewish movies or weddings or where it's depicted that the bride and the groom now have a ceremony called the breaking of the glass have you seen at the end of the ceremony a jewish bride and groom will stomp on a glass it's called the breaking of the glass because the Jewish temple is destroyed since 70 AD, so the men won't wear a crown. And the breaking of the glass pictures, you know, the tempering of their joy, even on the greatest day of their joy, because there's no Jewish temple. So that's how that ceremony, you know, came uh, into being 
Uh, but here, of course, we're in the 10th century uh, BC, and and Bathsheba crowns him. And we see that in this particular text on the day of his wedding, and on the day of the gladness of his heart. And it just closes tonight with this beautiful, beautiful little thing that um, what God has given to him in his bride is the best that he could have, right? And if you remember your bride on the day of the wedding, God gave you the best that there was uh, to, to be had. Revelation 19, 12, when Christ comes back, it says his eyes were as a flame of fire on his head with many crowns. Yeah. So he's coming That's back. That's beautiful. Right, yeah. yeah, Revelation 19, 12, that is. So, yeah, many, many, yeah. And we cast any crown we have right before his feet. We, we know that as well, too. So here we see that the procession, not so much of the ceremony itself, but the wedding procession. So we've got that. And, uh, you know, just as an application for our married couples, you know, tonight, uh, I would um, I would make your next anniversary just really special. That's what I would do. Make it really special. I don't care if it's an odd number or a strange number. Uh, bring out your best dress. Bring out your, your, your bridal dress if you still got it. Uh, pin it on with clothespins if it doesn't fit. Um, wear your best clothes, men. Order a cake. Recommit in a ceremony of which you can do it here, you know, with a minister or, or in your favorite spot, the covered bridge at Saxville. Um, celebrate celebrate big or small, but celebrate. That's my encouragement for married couples. And for those uh, who, you know, the Lord has taken home a spouse already celebrate what God gave. Uh, we, we ought to do that. Um, and to thank him for that. So, well, we got through chapter three and that was delightful. The dream, right. Of the courtship and then the uh, wedding procession itself. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. And, and next week we'll commence into chapter four. Father, um, thank you for this time in the Holy Word. And it certainly is not our regular text, of course, Lord, that we go to frequently. And, and most of us may not remember many of the, the verses that we've covered in chapter 3. But, Father, I praise you and I thank you for the diversity of your Holy Word that you should speak uh, about the, the fierce loyalty of uh, Shulamit, the bride, uh, for her husband when she was separated from him. And God, we pray that for every young couple, that they would have that grace from you, that they're fiercely loyal and would not even entertain sexual sin outside of marriage or with anyone else or in marriage with anyone else. Lord, oh God, please guard our marriages, our our newest of marriages, our middle marriages, our oldest of marriages, guard them, God, with your fierce loyalty and love, your commitment to us. Help us to see how fiercely loyal you are to us, Lord, when, when we are not even faithful um, to you as the bride. And forgive us, um, God, for our, our sins in those matters. So I do ask for the anointing of your spirit on our marriages and and that whenever that anniversary comes god that it would be just greatly greatly celebrated because it's what you have done and we thank you and praise you for that in christ's holy name amen